so first of all, let me get rid of this here. And then let's get started. Yeah, thanks for having me. In the next hour, we will talk about domain-driven design and Angular. And I want to start with one question. So what do you think, what does it take for a good architecture? If you think about your current projects, about your products, what does it take? Well, if you ask me, it takes a lot of experience and ideally from a diverse team. Everyone shall sit together and everyone shall bring his or her own experiences to the table. And of course, there are some ways to accelerate this process for process of doing an architecture. You can give them some caffeine or you could feed them with pizza. I made a lot of good experience with Pizza Provinciale, which is the pizza, you know, with ham and bacon on it, also with corn. It leads to the best architectures. But besides this, let's stick a bit with the topic experiences. Since years, people think about how to share experiences. And so some people came up with best practices. They wrote down best practices. Other people took a more formal approach. They wrote down patterns. And other people took some best practices, took some patterns, added a methodology. And what turned out was a, a methodology, a methodology using some philosophy. And one of those methodologies is domain-driven design. Perhaps domain-driven design is the only methodology bridging the gap between your user's requirements and your architecture. And so in this talk, I will answer one question, namely how to create sustainable architectures with ideas from domain-driven design. And here, two words are very important for me. The first word is sustainable. This is not about quick wins. This is not about creating a tiny application quickly. It is about an investment into the future, into something that can be maintained for 10 years or longer. And the second word that is important here is ideas. Domain-driven design is not a religion for me. Domain-driven design is for me a box with tools, and I'm using some of those tools to achieve this goal. So let's talk about the contents. First of all, I will give you an overview of domain-driven design. And then I will talk about a quite different topic, a topic that seems to have nothing in common with domain-driven design at first sight, namely mono-rebuild. But at the end of the second part, we will realize that both topics are sides of the same coin. And so I will bring both sides together and show how to use those two topics together, how to use mono repos together with the ideas of domain-driven design. But first of all, let me introduce myself a bit. I'm Manfred. I'm a trainer and consultant for Angular. I'm doing a lot of in-house trainings and in the last time also remote trainings. My current training is an advanced training for Angular in the enterprise. I am part of the Google Developer Expert Team, and I'm a trusted collaborator. So perhaps the funny story about the word collaborator, perhaps you know it, we in German have the exact same word. We also have the word collaborator, and it means exactly the same thing, but always in a negative way. So collaborating in German means teaming up with other people to destroy something. Well. And if you look at my first pull request for the Angular team, it was about the German meaning. Meanwhile, it is hopefully more about the English meaning. Saying this, I'm doing a lot in the German-speaking area of Europe. Okay, so let's get started with the first topic, with domain-driven design. When we look at domain-driven design from a high-level perspective, we see two strategies. There is strategic design and there is tactical design. Strategic design is about decomposing a big system into tinier, more maintainable parts. And tactical design is more about design patterns and practices. As I will talk about architecture, I will more stick with strategic design, especially in the first part of this 
uh, session, I will just do strategic design. Then I will pick several topics from the area of tactical design. And if you ask me what does strategic design do, I would answer it with this very picture. I would tell you strategic design tries to prevent a situation like this. A situation where everything is intermingled with everything else. Because if everything is intermingled with everything else, it is not maintainable anymore. I guess we all know this situation. You are changing something here and you are introducing a breaking change there. Something we not really want to have. So let me give you an example. The first application I wrote about 20 years ago was the e-procurement system. And you know, your first application is like your first love. You will never, ever forget it. Uh, that's why it came into mind for me when I prepared for this talk. And back then, we could have written this huge e-procurement system, but instead of that, we could have also written several tiny systems, like a catalog system or like a approval system where the manager is saying, no, you don't get this new laptop. We had the ordering system, which was sending out your requests to the right vendor. and we had something that was a bit special. We had a specification system. The specification system was for the IT department. They specified your request. They said, hey, you need a new laptop. You get this laptop because you are a power worker and you get this weak laptop because you are not a power worker. Funny thing, in our specification, one example was about CD burners. The example was, hey, someone is requesting a CD burner without having the allowance for it, without being allowed to use a CD burner. And of course, that was forbidden because back then a CD burner was an object of prestige, quite an expensive one. Nowadays, it is not an object of prestige. If I ask my boy if he knows what a CD burner is, he will very likely say, no, I don't know it at all. Well, he is only three years old. Perhaps this is one reason, but I think you get the point. So the whole point here is to subdivide a big system into tinier parts. We are calling those parts subdomains. And those subdomains shall be self-contained, as self-contained as possible. So if you ask me how to identify all those subdomains, the answer is you have to look at your business processes. And this is a bit special because normally when doing software architecture, we have to concentrate on technical stuff. But now you have to look at the use case specific stuff at your processes. If you look at this ordering process here, you will see that first of all, an employee is requesting a product. And then the IT expert is specifying this order they are saying you get this strong laptop because you are a power user. The manager is saying you get it or you don't get it. And then the buying agent makes sure that your order is sent out to the cheapest or to the best vendor. When we look at the other process, we see something similar. One manager is saying, hey, I need more money. And his manager or her manager will say, of course, you can have all that money or no, you don't get it. Just by looking at the processes, you see you have several domains involved here. Normally, each domain has at least one domain expert. It could be the employee, it could be the manager. And so we see we have at least four business domains here. Another way to identify domains is to look at your main entities. For instance, when it comes to requesting a product, the product itself is the main entity. When it comes to approving an order, the product, of course, plays a role, but perhaps only a tiny role, because here the budget and the hierarchy is more important. The product itself might be just a name and a price when it comes to approving the order. When it comes to requesting it, it can also be about a lot of images, Q and A's, some ratings of the product and so on. 
So when you've identified all your subdomains, which is not an easy task, you will find out that you need to model those domains and that you need to model the relationships between them. Perhaps you find out that all the domains need some data from the catalog, especially product data. And so one first idea could be to give all those domains direct access to the catalog. That could be a first idea, but obviously it is not the best idea. Because if every domain has full access to the catalog, you will have a lot of breaking changes for sure. You change something in the catalog and you influence all the other domains. This is the very situation we want to prevent. Think about all those cables. Think about this in the mingled situation. Well, a better idea could be to come up with a shared kernel. Shared kernel is just a fancy domain-driven design term for a bunch of shared libraries. But also the shared kernel is not the last word on this because the shared kernel is normally something everyone is responsible for. And if everyone is responsible for it, at the end of the day, no one is responsible for it. It is like cleaning up a shared flat. If you are sharing the flat and if everyone is responsible for cleaning it up, you can imagine how this flat would look like. We always say it's well, the one who thinks that the flat is dirty shall clean it up. So the big question here is also about the responsibilities. If everyone is responsible, no one will be responsible. And so this can also lead to breaking changes. There is another approach. I'm calling it the API approach. An API is just a tiny facade, a tiny facade exposing selected things for other domains. That means other domains don't see the whole catalog domain. They only see selected things. And only those selected things need to be backwards compatible in order to prevent breaking changes. The official domain-driven design term is open or host service, but the name service has another meaning, another meaning in the area of Angular, so I'm going with the name API. It also fits into this black box here, so it seems to be more fitting. When it comes to domain-driven design and to this original book where all the ideas have been written up into, you will find a lot of additional approaches for cross-domain communication. But for the time being, I will stick with those ideas, namely with the shared kernel and with APIs. So this was the first side of my coin. The second side of the coin is at first sight something that's completely different. It's a technical topic. It's about mono repositories. Perhaps you've heard about mono repositories. To put it in a nutshell, it is just a big code repository which consists of all your subsystems. Everything that belongs to your system goes in there. In my case, I have an approval library for my approval domain, I have a catalog library, I have a shared validation library and the application itself. Everything that belongs to your system goes in here. Your system is subdivided by means of folders at first sight. And one nice thing about this workspace is this node modules folder. Not that it exists, but that it exists just once because that means you just have one version of Angular, one version of Rx, one version of NGRx, and that's good. Just imagine what would happen if you had Angular 5 here and Angular 9 there, and imagine you try to compile everything together. I guarantee you all hell would break loose. So obviously it's a good idea to have one version in here. Saying this, one advantage is it prevents version conflict. And another advantage is you don't have the burden with distributing your own libraries. Just think about this. If you had distributed libraries, you had to implement your libraries, you had to assign a version number, you had to publish those libraries. Then you had to integrate the libraries into your application. You had to download it, you had to make sure everything works, and of course you will find a bug. 
go to you do? You have to report this bug. You have to switch over to the library again. You have to fix the bug. You have to assign a new version number. You have to publish the library and so on and so forth. That means if you are using distributed libraries for decomposing a big system, you might run crazy. It is nothing you want to do. So creating a workspace, a monorepo workspace, is really a piece of cake with the Angular CLI. You need the Angular CLI, you new up a new workspace, and then within that workspace, you can generate an application or a library. Then you can serve the application or you can build the application. This works since Angular 6. Saying this, if you are not fully uh, for this idea, then I have a good message for you. The monorepo is not a one-way street. You can move back and forth all the time. Let's say you have this validation library as part of your monorepo. And let's say you want to share it with other companies or with other project teams having their own repository. Well, in this case, you can export it using NBM. And so you have the best of both worlds. You have it within your Mono repository. That means it grows within your Mono repository. It gets more major alongside your big application. But other teams, other companies, other uh, branches of your company can also use it using NPM if they don't want to use your big Mono repository. And saying this, this is exactly how Angular is developed. Angular is developed within a Mono repository and that makes sure that Angular Forms version 9 works together with Angular Core version 9 and that this works together with Angular Common version 9. And when they are done, they press a button and then they are exporting everything for the rest of us using NPM. If you like this idea of the Mono repository, you will very likely love Annex. Annex is what I'm calling the sugar dip on top of the Angular CLI. It extends the Angular CLI. It teaches the Angular CLI new tricks. And one of those tricks is this here. You see the structure of your application. You can get an dependency graph that shows which library is accessing which other library. And this is where the cycle closes, because in this way you can guarantee that not every, each and every library is accessing each and every other library. You can prevent this intermingling situation we've talked about before. And X comes with other tricks and other nice features. I will show you some of them a bit later. Saying this, if you are wondering how to get started with an X, just do what you did before, but instead of engine, you use this red command, use npm in it, and the rest is the same. Saying this, you still have an Angular CLI project because an X is only extending the Angular CLI. So ng generate, ng serve, ng build will work as before. Okay, so much for theory. We have seen two parts of the same coin, the methodological part as well as the technical part. And now let's try to bring those two parts together. If you try to bring those two parts together, first of all, I would create one subfolder for each domain in my mono repository. It means in my case, I have perhaps a catalog folder, I have an ordering folder, I have some other folders. And then I will very likely have a shared folder for my shared kernel. After that, I can fill all my folders with some libraries. And the people at Novel defined several categories of libraries. One category is the feature library. A feature library is a library consisting of smart components. A smart components know about your use cases. It knows about your processes. It knows how to help the user to accomplish a given goal. That means those components are quite specific. Then you have UI libraries. 
They consist of dump components. A dump component does not know about your use cases, but because it does not know, it is super reusable. Just think about the date time picker. A date, a date time picker is very dumb when it comes to knowledge about your domain. It does not know anything about your use cases. It does not even know which kind of date it is displaying. Is it a order date? Is it a delivery date? Is it a deadline? It still does not know. But because it does not know, it is reusable with all the use cases out there. That means because of separating those two layers, you make your system more reusable. Then you have something I'm calling the domain layer. It contains your client side model, but also some logic to communicate with the backend. We will see more about this in a minute. And then there is a utility layer, which holds your utility functions. For instance, authentication functions or locking functions or functions for converting dates into strings and vice versa. This has a big advantage. One advantage here is you have more order in here. Just by structuring your application into columns and into rows, you have more order. And there is less discussion about which building block goes where. You clearly know, oh, this is a smart component from the catalog domain, so it goes in here. And you know, oh, this is a domain object, and so it goes into the domain layer. Saying this, there are several further advantages. One advantage is you can easily introduce access restrictions. Here I'm saying I'm having vertical access restrictions, which means the feature is allowed to access everything else, but the domain is only allowed to access the utility. One layer is only allowed to access layers below it. And of course, you can also introduce vertical access restrictions, horizontal access restrictions like this here, where I'm saying, well, the catalog itself is only allowed to talk with the catalog and with the shared domain. And ordering is only allowed to talk with ordering and also with the shared domain. One more time, this prevents that everything is accessing everything else, and so we can prevent the situation I've showed you before with the picture with all the cables on. Perhaps you're saying, well, yeah, that looks nice. I have access restrictions, I have more order, but somehow that looks overwhelming. And well, it's not that overwhelming at all, because normally you don't have a full rectangle here. Normally you have just some libraries within one domain and some libraries within the shared folder. Let me talk about this in a minute. Before I'm talking about this, let's also talk about my API idea I've shown you before. This idea I've took out of domain-driven design. There is namely one issue with the shared kernel. Just imagine you are building a component into the shared kernel. This component will of course have some dependencies for other components. And so you need also to pull those other components into the shared kernel. But also those other components will have some dependencies. And so you are ending up moving everything into the shared kernel. And you can imagine when the shared, when the shared kernel has about two thirds of your application, it is not worth much. And so sometimes it's not the best idea to move stuff into the shared kernel sometimes it's better to define an api like you see here an api is basically just a library with an index to s exposing specific things for other domains not everything only specific things for instance everything ordering needs from the catalog as mentioned before, this all is not that exhausting because you don't have a full rectangle. You have normally feature libraries and domain libraries as part of your real domains, and the rest is kind of reusable, and so it goes to your shared kernel. One more thing I will talk about is isolating your domain. You can subdivide your domain into three parts, according 
first of all, the theory behind domain-driven design, but also according some best practices in the Angular world. Saying this, you have the domain model in the middle of your domain library. It consists of your entities. If you don't like the word entity on the client, think about it as about of your client side model. And you have some business logic in here. Business logic you need on the client, stuff like validation, for instance. Saying this, of course, the majority of the business logic is in the backend, but sometimes you need a tiny amount of it in the front end too. Infrastructure is about data access and application is about facades. A facade that shields the complexity of your domain, a facade that exposes just what you need for one or for another use case. And saying this, the facade can only make, can also make use of state management. It can also hide details of state management so that the consumer of the domain, your smart components, do not need to know about your state management library at all. Perhaps you're saying, yeah, that looks nice, but really, Manfred, layering is so much 1990s. Yes, you are right, but anyway, it really works for me and for a lot of other companies. But saying this, this is not about layering for me. You can use alternatives for layering like hexagonal architectures or a clean architecture. This is not about layering. This is just about decomposing a big system into libraries and it is about restricting access. Because only if you restrict the access, you can make sure that not everything talks to everything else. I think this is enough for the theory, but let's have a look at the practice. Let's have a look at a concrete implementation for this. Let me skip the presentation here. Let me skip this bar and let me move to an example. So what we see here is a mono repository. I've created this mono repository with an X. And at first sight, it looks like a traditional Angular solution. There's just a tiny difference. Instead of a big project folder, we have an application and a library folder. And I think you can guess what goes in there. The application folder holds your applications. I just have one, a big monolith called UI. You don't need to do it. You can have several applications. For instance, one application per domain, which would bring you quite near to the idea of micro frontends. But here, for the sake of simplicity, I just go with one application. And here I have several libraries, several libraries organized with subfolders. And as mentioned, each subfolder is just one domain. Here I have my catalog domain, I have my ordering domain, and here I have my shared card. Let's have a look to the catalog domain. The catalog domain has several features. It has some domain logic. It has an API. If we look to the feature browse product, we will see an index.ts, a barrel. And I'm always saying this index.ts is reason enough to go with libraries. This is reason enough to decompose a big system into libraries which are part of a mono repo because this is your public API. Everything you are exporting here needs to be backwards compatible because everything you are exporting here can be used by other libraries of your domain. Everything you are not exporting here is your secret. And it is good to have secrets, trust me. It is really good to have secrets because everything you keep a secret can be changed afterwards without introducing breaking changes. This is one big thing about stable software design. If we go in here into our library, of course, we see an Angular module. It is just the ordinary Angular module, importing some stuff, declaring some stuff, exporting some stuff. And of course, as this is a feature, a feature from the catalog domain, it needs the catalog domain library. 
the catalog domain library with the data access services and with my client side model. And this is important, imported that way. And perhaps you're noticing something. Here I'm not writing something like dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash this and that. This is something that would drive us crazy. No, I'm using a mapped name, a mapped name that looks like an uh, ordinary library. And of course, the TypeScript compiler needs to know where this name is pointing to. And the good message is NX is setting up this very mapping. It is done for you automatically. It happens within DS config JSON. If you look here, we have a lot of path mappings, path mappings that say that this name, for instance, points to that file here. And one more time, this is where the cycle closes because you see here the map name is pointing to the index as to the public API of this very library. Saying this, this is also the key or one key for wide level solutions. Just imagine you have this customer who gave you tiny sheets of paper with people on it or bridges and numbers on it. I guess you know those sheets of paper. I really love them. And for that, you are implementing a special feature for this customer, which I'm calling customer A here. Just change this and then you can compile the application for customer A and you make sure that you only have the source code customer A needs in there. Perhaps you're saying now, hey, Manfred, you're using comments right in the middle of a JSON file. This is forbidden. Yes, I know it's not allowed, but do you know something? Sometimes we have to risk something. That really makes me feel alive, like an uh, old runabout. No, just kidding. In real life, I would have several DS configs, and if I compile for this customer, I would use this DS config. If I compile for that customer, I use I would use that DS config. Okay, so we have this big application. We've subdivided it into small libraries. Besides this, it is just a traditional Angular project. But now let's have a look at one of the features of an X. Let's go to the console and let's run the dependency graph script. Look at this. It gives me a graphical representation of my project. Let's zoom in. It shows me, okay, I have an end-to-end -end testing suite and I have my big UI monolith. And then I have here several domains with several libraries. Now let's make sure everything fits the screen. Let me do a screenshot and let me switch over to OneNote. Let me paste it. And now let's draw a bit here on this copy, on this hard copy. So if you look here, we have an ordering feature. That means this is a library from the ordering domain. And if you look here, here we have the domain logic of the ordering domain. Let's take another color. Here you see we have a feature from the catalog, catalog feature browse products. And here we have another feature from the catalog. And here we have the catalog domain logic. And here we have the API of the catalog. And the rest is part of the shared kernel, a shared UI component for addresses and a shared library for authentication. So just by looking at the colors now, you can tell that you don't easily access another domain. This is forbidden. If you want to access another domain, you have either to use the shared kernel like here, or you have to use uh, an API that is exposing specific things for you. And one more time, this prevents this intermingled system and this makes sure your software is maintainable in longer. But now let's do something that's a bit bad. Let me be the bad guy for just a minute. Let me access the UI library from within the authentication library. Let me do 
this access here. This access is forbidden according to our software architecture. Because if you think about our software architecture, you see we had a layer with UI libraries and below we had the utility layer. And I said we are only allowed to access everything in a top-down manner. Here I'm doing the exactly opposite. I am accessing a library bottom-up. I'm accessing the UI library from within my utility layer, and this is kind of forbidden. Let's find out how NX is reacting upon this. For this, I'm switching over to my shared util out module. And here I'm importing the UI layer, which is kind of forbidden. And hey, I'm getting immediately a slap into my face. It is telling me that the project typed with stacked with type util can only depend on libraries stacked with type util. Or to put it in another way, a utility library is only allowed to use other utility libraries. It is the last library in my stack. I really love this, but what I love more is I can do this on the console. Let me close this console here. Let me open up a new console and let me run ng-lint. ng-lint with shared util of. I'm getting the same error here. Just a second and another second and come on. Where is my error? Here it is. Exactly the same error. And honestly, I like this more. I like this more not because I'm an old guy, not because I grew up in the 90s. I like this on the console because everything that happens on the console can be automated within your CI process, within your build server. That means you can check on your build server if someone broke your architecture. And if someone broke the architecture, you can send out an email to the whole team. You can tell the whole team, hey, Manfred broke the architecture. Go to him and help him to grow his awareness. It's up to, to you how you help him to grow his awareness about this very architecture. But please be nice. Okay, so you can really automate it. That's nice, isn't it? But now the main question is, how does NX know about our architecture? about this architecture with columns and rows, with domains and with layers. Well, at the end of the day, it's not difficult at all. NX gives you this NX JSON file. This is created for you automatically. And you can now use this NX JSON file to assign tags to each and every library, also to applications. A tag is nothing else than a category. You can write in here what you want. You can also write in here a base64 encoded string if you want to look like an expert, but don't do it. Uh, but at the end of the day, NX does not care about what you write in here. I've assigned two categories to most of my libraries. The first category is telling NX in which column my library is. Here I'm saying the catalog feature belongs to my catalog domain, to my first column. If you remember the architecture from before, the catalog was part of the first column. And I'm also saying, well, it also de de uh, depends to my type feature, to my feature layer, to this first row in my architecture. I'm doing the same with all the other libraries. For instance, here I'm saying catalog domain belongs to my first row, to my row with the catalog domain, and it belongs to the, I think it was the third column, the column with the domain logic. I'm just doing this for all my libraries, and after doing this, you can define linting rules for this category. For this, switch over to your DS lint JSON. Uh, an X team just put in here an empty rule that is called NX enforce module boundaries. And now it's up to you to use this rule for your meanings. Here I'm saying, hey, domain catalog is only allowed to access other stuff in domain catalog and domain shared. And I'm saying, 
domain ordering is only allowed to access other stuff in domain ordering. It is allowed to access the API of the catalog, exposing specific things for me, and it is allowed to access the shared kernel. And the shared kernel is only allowed to talk with the shared kernel itself. Using those free access restrictions, we've defined our horizontal rules you've seen on the slides. I'm also defining the vertical rules. Here I'm saying a feature library is only allowed to talk with domain logic, utility, APIs, and UI. But if you look here, the UI is only allowed to talk with the utility layer, and the utility layer is also only allowed to talk with itself. You might even remove this, because if utilities talk to utilities, you have cycles. And as you know, compilers are not that happy about cycles. But anyway, it's up to you how restrictive you are and how much uh, possibilities you grant to the rest of the team. Okay, that's quite nice, isn't it? But I want to show you a bit more. Let's get rid of this one more time. I want to show you a nice feature of an act, and for this I will start with a simple thought experiment. For this, let's get rid of those lines here, and let me write some other lines. Just imagine we are changing this catalog API. What would you say which other libraries can be affected by the change? If you look at that architecture, what would you say which library can be affected by a breaking change here? Well, of course, not the catalog domain, because it does not depend upon the catalog API. But everything that is a parent belongs to it, and so all the parents can be broken by introducing a breaking change here. The rest of the system cannot be influenced by a breaking change here. And that means if we change something only here, we only need to retest this library and all its parents. We don't need to retest the rest. That means we can save a lot of time when it comes to retesting, also when it comes to recompiling, because in theory, the rest does not either need to be recompiled. Of course, this thought experiment is quite easy. In practice, it's not that easy to find something like this out after programming a whole day on a feature. And thankfully, NX can help you with this. To demonstrate you this feature, let me get rid of all my changes. And now let's introduce a major change within my catalog API. Let's move over to my catalog API module. And now I'm doing a major change. Have you seen it? This here is my major change. And now let's go to the console and run affected, affected depth graph. And an X is now looking into my Git history. It is doing some static analysis of my application, and it clearly shows me what can be affected by a change in the catalog API. Well, it can be this uh, library here, my feature library, my deployment monolith, and of course, the end-to-end -end testing suite. If I just display everything, here we see just by looking at the colors, the rest of the system cannot be affected, and that means the rest of the system does not need to get retested or recombined. And for this, we have also some nice NPM scripts in here. Let me close the console, and let me open a new console here. If we look at to, uh, into our package JSON, we see, for instance, that we have a script called affected test. It is just executing the unit tests of the affected libraries. The same is true for end-to-end -end tests using affected end-to-end -end and using affected build 
only the affected applications are rebuilt. That means if we had another application, let's say we have this application here, which is just using this library, this library would not be rebuilt because it is not affected and also the application would not be rebuilt. Nice, isn't it? So I think that can save you a lot of time when going with a mono repository. Perhaps you're saying now, yeah, that looks nice, but somehow it looks overwhelming because we have all that libraries. But saying this, creating a new library is not that difficult. Just create a library instead of an ng module. It is not a big difference if you type in ng generate module or if you type in ng-generate library. For you, it's about the same effort, isn't it? Here I'm creating a feature which is called compare. I want to compare two laptops, and it is part of my directory uh, ordering. Ordering. Just press Enter. Yeah, let's go brew. And yeah, everything is uh, generated for me. My ng module is generated. My index.s, where is it? Here it is, is generated for me. That means I have a public API and all the rest. And if we look to our application, I need to press escape to come back here to this mode. Then we see that my catalog now should have a new feature, no, not the catalog, the ordering domain has the new feature, which is called compare. Nice, isn't it? A full flag library. I can now fill with the logic for my feature. Okay, so let's get back to the slides. We have seen we have a lot of fine-grained libraries and that's for the better because the library is the unit of recompilation and the unit of retesting saves you a lot of time. We can introduce fine-grained access restrictions. We have information hiding because each and every library has this index.ts exposing everything for other libraries. The rest is part of your secrets. And as mentioned, it is good to have secrets. And this might be a good alternative for NG modules. If you have seen my talk from yesterday, then you know that NG modules might become optional in the future. And what's better than using a platform feature instead of an NG module, a library, a barrel with an index.ds file. And as mentioned, NG generate library is as easy as writing NG generate module. Okay, so much for the strategic design. We have seen how to subdivide the application into layers and into columns, and we have seen how to define access restrictions. Now, I want to present you one design pattern out of the area of tactical design that proved to be handy and that is quite famous in the world of Angular since about a year. About a year ago, Thomas Burleson uh, proposed the idea of the facade for hiding details of your, of your state management. And he also uh, did a talk last year here on uh, ng-conf. You can check out this talk on uh, YouTube, for instance. And that's why I'm calling this kind of facade the Burleson facade. You know, when it comes to Star Trek, we have the Jeffrey's tube, here in Angular, we have now Burleson facades. And a Burleson facade is, at the end of the day, a simple idea which brings you a lot. Just think about your domain library. Your domain library consists of a lot of stuff. A lot of giant side, let's say, models like products and orders. We have some logic in here, for instance, logic to validate an order. We have some data access services. And now if you write a feature component, a smart component for a use case, the author of this component will say, oh my, 
I have to concentrate on all of this and all of these details. I don't want to know all those details. I just want to know what I need for my feature. And so the idea is to introduce a facade which shields the details of the domain, which just exposes everything you need for just one use case. This facade is just a service. It can hold some state. This here is the state. It has a constructor which gets hold of the other stuff by means of dependency injection, and it provides some methods for your use case. Of course, it would be a nice idea to not make Angular to pull the state, so please use observables here. Observables are also the key for messaging between parts of your application. But now the big question is, where does those observable come from? And the very simple answer is, this observable comes from a behavior subject. This is the simplest way to provide an observable for uh, state management. And sometimes using a behavior subject is good enough because we don't want to over-engineer our applications. Over-engineering is as bad as under-engineering, if you ask me. And perhaps this is just okay. That means you have here your facades, and each and every facade has one or several behavior subject exposed as, uh, let's say, exposed as an observable. But perhaps sometimes you find out it's not a good idea to have all those distributed uh, behavior subjects, especially if it looks like this, if you have a lot of overlappings. At least since Ghostbusters, we know that overlappings are not a good idea. If everyone is allowed to write every state, we will have a lot of redundancies and a lot of inconsistencies, and also we will end up with a lot of cycles. And that's why a lot of smart people invented state management libraries like NGRX. The good thing is, with using a facade, you can introduce the state management library on demand. Just squeeze it under your facade. The rest of the application will not notice because the rest of the application is just seeing your facade. This is especially a good thing for all the people out there not knowing if they need NshareX. If you know for sure that you need NshareX, go with it. Skip the facades, just use NshareX. In this case, NshareX with its actions and selectors will be your facade. But if you are not sure, then I recommend you start tiny. Start not with an over-engineered architecture. Start tiny with behavior subject and refactor if you see you need something that's more sophisticated. Okay, until now we have seen a lot of features implemented in our repository, a lot of features that go conform with ideas of domain-driven design. Perhaps you're saying, well, that's nice, but I have to do a lot of steps by hand. I have to create facades by hand. I have to create models by hand. I have to create all my libraries by hand, as well as access restrictions. And guess what? This all can be automated. There is a new feature called NX plugins, and you can automate everything I've showed you using a plugin. Those plugins use features from the Angular CLI, like schematics or builders. And I exactly did that. I created an, an X plugin called DDD for Domain Driven Design. The full name is Angular Architects DDD, and it just generates everything I've showed you in this hour. Let me give you a tiny example for this. Let me jump out of my presentation, and let me move into my example. So to get this plugin, just call ng-add angular architect slash ddd. This will install everything for you. I've already prepared for this. That means I have already installed it. After that, you can say ng-generate, and then you go on not with component or with service or with module or with library. No, 
you go on with Angular Architect slash DDD domain. And now I would say, let's create a approval domain. A domain approval cannot find module. Something went wrong here. I'm very sorry. So let's just ng add this library again. Stuff goes down. Just a second. Okay, I let this run in the background. If we have some time left, then I will show it you. But what I wanted to show you is at the end of the day, you need one command for a new domain and you need another command for a feature and that's it. It generates everything for you especially the access restrictions, the libraries, some components, some facades, and so on and so forth. Okay, it seems like it was installed, so let's give it another try. And she generate Angular Architect Domain Design Domain. Yeah, here is it. Everything is generated for you. As you see here, your module for your domain, also some tags within your annex JSON, and now let, let's go on with a feature. Feature, let's call the feature manage requests. And this is part of the approval domain. I'm using the entity request and the application is my deployment monolith. Just let me double check. I want to create a feature manage request. Yeah. And one more time, hopefully, let's cross fingers, everything is generated for you. Now the feature library is generated, as you see here, with a module, with an index.ts. You have a facade generated. You have even some components generated, a request entity, as well as a data service, and all the access restrictions within DSConfigJSON. But because it's that much fun, let's create another feature Let's call it request budget. This is about a budget request. And just give us some seconds. Wow, the second feature is also created. Now let's, for the last time of today, generate a dependency graph. Let's go away with this command and let's run npm run app graph, npm run app graph. Okay. And well, look at that beauty. We have our own domain with two features and our domain library. Everything is just in place. Okay. Saying this, this is open source, you can also download it and modify it so that it fits more for your needs. Yeah. If you like this talk, perhaps you like my free ebook, you can download it here at angulararchitects.io slash book. It consists of all those topics and some additional topics like micro frontends. Just check it out. If you like it, uh, and if you like it, drop me an email if you have some feedback also drop me an email. Okay, we've seen several things today. We've seen that slicing a big application into subdomains is a good idea. Also that slicing it into layers is a good idea. That brings this matrix that assures that not everything is intermingled with everything else. We end up having fine-grained libraries and so we can enforce access restrictions. Also, with NX plugins, you can automate all this stuff to not make it too boring to automate stuff you need all the time. And there is a last thing, and I always want you to remember this very last thing. It is very important for me. 
if you forget everything, please keep this one last thing in mind, namely, you can accelerate your software architecture process with coffee in and with pizza. And I really recommend, you know, it, the pizza provinciale, which is the pizza with corn and bacon on it. I only made good experiences with it. So thanks for having me. It was really a pleasure to be part of this conference. Here you have my contact data. You find all my slides in my blog. And if you want, follow me on Twitter so that we can keep in contact.